1459, a boy was born in the capital city of the crumbling Kingdom of Ava. On both sides of his family, he was descended from long dead kings who had once ruled the very land that Ava now sat in. Little did the King of Ava know the burdens that this infant would one day give to his own descendants. The boy's name was Mingyi Niao, and his ambition would lead him to become the founding member of the Tunggu dynasty of Burma, also known as Myanmar, a dynasty that would one day rule the largest empire ever formed in the history of mainland Southeast Asia. Mingyi Niao spent his formative years in the city of Ava, the current day city of Inhua. His grandfather was a general in the Avon army named Sithu Kwayatan. Due to this, he was likely raised in close proximity to the royal family of Ava, the Monyan dynasty. The head of this clan, and current king of Ava, was a man named Thyathura. This king, like the kings of Ava before him, was constantly under threat from powers on the borders of his kingdom and internally plagued by rebellious governors inside Ava. In 1470, one of these governors, with assistance from the Hanthanwadi kingdom to the south, incited his own rebellion. King Thyathura responded promptly, sending an army under the command of his trusted general, Sithu Kwayatan, the grandfather of Mingyi Niao. General Sithu crushes the rebellion. His prize for this victory is the job of the man he had just defeated, the governorship of Tunggu province. It's likely at this point, following his grandfather, that the 11-year-old Mingyi Niao first enters the city of Tunggu that would one day become his seat of power. Although a small periphery province of Ava, Tunggu held its own advantages. Sitting along the Sitang River, the distance from Ava to Tunggu meant that Sithu Kwayatan was on his own in terms of governing the province. With increased autonomy, there also came a price, the well-placed paranoia of the king. As the years went on, it looked as if Tunggu may revolt again under its new governor. When Sithu began repairing and building onto Tunggu's defenses in 1476, this was the last straw. On the orders of King Thyathura, Governor Sithu was dragged all the way to Ava by his own hair. Here he was thrown in front of the king, and in his humiliation was forced to explain his actions. With his obedience won by means of fear, the king of Ava sent Governor Sithu back to continue his supervision of Tunggu province. In August of 1480, the king of Ava died. His son, King Minkong II, would succeed him. As seems to be a theme, a new king in Ava meant open rebellions from nearly all of his provinces. Three of his younger brothers opposed his coronation and prepared to raise arms against him. Two of the brothers started their opposition in the west, while the third and youngest brother began his revolt just south of Ava and directly north of Tunggu. Ava's new king called upon the assistance of Governor Sithu Kwayatan to subdue his younger brother on both of their doorsteps. The loyal governor obliges and more than confidently marches an army north. Without even waiting for extra fighting men supplied by Ava, he marches directly to the city at the center of the uprising, Yamathen. The brother of King Minkong II sends a sallying force out of the city to dislodge the Tonggu. A battle outside the town walls ensues and would see Governor Sithu defeat his foe. This was only the first wave, however. As another round of fresh soldiers crashed into his army, the men of Tunggu began to falter. In the bloodshed, Governor Sithu Kwayatan would perish. His army survived the engagement, but could not sustain the siege of Yamathen, and returned to Tunggu in defeat after two more months. The self-proclaimed King of Yamathen would remain independent for nearly the rest of King Minkong II's entire reign. Upon his death, the son of Sithu Kwayatan and the uncle of the now 22-year-old Mingyi Niao, a man named Min Sithu, is appointed as the new governor of Tunggu province. While King Minkong II of Ava managed to put down the rebellions of his two brothers in the west, a new set of rebellions broke out in that following year. One in the north was headed by a Thai-descended people known as the Shan, which was the largest minority group in the kingdom of Ava. A second rebellion broke out in the south, again on the very doorstep of Tunggu. 
the province of Prom. Here, the governor was a man named Thado Minsaw. Taking advantage of Ava's turmoil, he declared his independence and proclaimed himself as the king of Prom. Ava sent an army to contest his split, but they were soundly defeated by King Thado Minsaw. Min Sithu ruled as the governor of Tungu while the chaos of disloyal subjects surrounded him. With only a sliver of a border connecting him to his Avon overlords, he did not wane and remained loyal to Ava. In this fragile time, Ming Yi Niao enters our story, asking his uncle, Governor Min Sithu, for his daughter's hand in marriage. Min Sithu, perhaps seeing through the ambitions of Ming Yi Niao, rejects the proposal. He does not go quietly, however, and continues pressing for the marriage, continually facing rejection. Maybe it was true love that made him do it. Maybe it was pure, unbridled ambition. Maybe it was a mix of the two. Regardless of his motive, the outcome would be all the same. In April of 1485, Ming Yi Niao conspires a plot to assassinate his uncle. The plan goes accordingly and results in the death of Governor Min Sithu. With no one in his way, the 26-year-old Ming Yi Niao then marries his first cousin, Siu Min. With this marriage secured, he then names himself as the new governor of Tungu province. The unsolicited killing of a governor, and even one's kin at that matter, was usually met with strong transgression by the kingdom of Ava. In more peaceful times, it's likely that an army would have been sent to unseat Ming Yi Niao, but these were far from peaceful times. Racked by multiple civil wars, the king of Ava needed every friend that he could get. Instead of declaring independence as his neighbors had, Ming Yi Niao sends gifts to the king of Ava, showing his loyalty, among them being two young elephants, an animal revered in Southeast Asia as both mystical and deadly on the fields of battle. King Mingkong II accepts this tribute and allows for Ming Yi Niao to continue governing Tunggu in the aftermath of his uncle's assassination. Min Sithu, for his four year stint as governor, was quite passive, accomplishing very little. Ming Yi Niao was in stark contrast to his uncle. To turn Tunggu from a tiny backwater province into a regional power, he began a campaign against the water itself. Receiving around 2,091 millimeters of precipitation annually, Myanmar ranks 27th among modern countries in terms of yearly rainfall. Combined with the many rivers that run through this land, this is simply one of the soggiest places on earth. Any campaign against the water would have been a tremendous task to undertake. For six whole years, from 1485 to 1491, Ming Yi Niao builds dams along the tributaries of the Sitong River. This left room for more things like homes, rice fields, pastures, and it also left room for the more ambitious building projects of the governor. About 20 miles downstream from Tunggu, Ming Yi Niao began the construction of a new city that would act as his new seat of power. Its name was Dwayawadi, and it came complete with strong walls, Buddhist temples, and an elaborate palace that was only too extraordinary for a lowly governor to reside in. The size and grandeur of one's palace often reflected the authority of the owner. The palace of Dwayawadi appeared as if a mighty king resided within. The reason for the construction of such a magnificent city quickly became apparent. A year after completion, and without permission from his Avon overlord, Ming Yi Niao invades the southern kingdom of Hanthanwadi. With the death of Hanthanwadi's king in the previous year, a civil war had split the kingdom. Ming Yi Niao was looking to take full advantage of this apparent weakness. The only thing standing in his way was the Shan governor of northern Hanthanwadi. To Tang Bua. Well, him and the elephant that he rode on. To spare the lives of countless men, To Tang Bua challenges Ming Yi Niao to a one on one duel. Not on horseback or on foot, but atop their own elephants. Putting the lance wielding, destriere riding knights of Europe to shame, if the sources are to be believed, the governor versus governor showdown began when the elephants charged toward one another. When the elephants passed one another, Ming Yi Niao 
jumped from the saddle of his own elephant and atop his opponents. Here he cut down Governor Toteng Bois and won a battle by single combat. He then took his spoils, among them being slaves, buffalo, and of course, the elephant whose rider he had just slain. Mingyi Niao would continue in annual raids of northern Hanthanwadi for the following three years. Once the civil wars of Hanthanwadi had mostly concluded in 1495, their king could now shift his attention to Tonggu. If to be believed, the king sent a massive force consisting of a thousand elephants and 160,000 fighting men north. This number is likely inflated, but it was clear that the men of Tonggu were supremely outnumbered. In conjunction with this army, Hanthanwadi also sends the majority of its fleet up the Sitang River. Hanthanwadi had mustered a devastating counterattack. They quickly overtake much of southern Tanggu. Ming Yi Niao and his army are forced to hide behind the walls of the recently built city of Dwayawadi. A siege then ensues while Hanthanwadi forces also continue to march north and begin the siege of Tonggu city itself. The province of Tonggu was on the edge of collapse. To break both sieges, Ming Yi Niao sallies out of Dwayawadi. After a few failed attempts, he would eventually find success, pushing the Hanthanwadi back to their lands. The besiegers of Tonggu evade capture by boarding their ships and retreating downstream. Ming Yi Niao, after nearly a year and a half of siege, had survived the war that he had started without permission, but just barely. Tonggu was devastated, and many of the building projects he had constituted in the first part of his reign lay in ruin. This was a learning moment for Ming Yi Niao, as he only started a war with one other entity in the region after this. As Hanthanwadi laid waste upon Tonggu, the king of Evo was distracted by his brother's continued rebellion in Yamaten. They would fight for another five years, failed siege bleeding into wet season interruption, bleeding into next year's failed siege. In 1500, the brotherly feud came to a sudden end when the king of Yamaten died unexpectedly. Yamathan, without a fight, then surrendered and returned under the fold of King Mingkong II. The 20-year rebellion of Yamathan, on top of Prom's independence and much of the northern Shan states revolting, left Ava a husk of a great kingdom. The king of Ava's strength was now similar and perhaps even weaker than his Tonggu subject. How could it get any worse than this? King Mingkong II died within a year of his own brother. His son and successor was a 15-year-old boy named Narapati, now King Narapati II. As tradition seemed to permit, when the King of Ava died, his kingdom immediately erupted with a fresh set of rebellions, this time centering mostly on the northern Shan states that one by one started to break away from Ava. Still, Tunggu remained loyal, mostly. With many inside of Ava made tired by years of endless conscription and warfare, the Burmese people began to see Tunggu as a safe alternative. Isolated away from the Avon mainland, the now hectic Irrawaddy River system, Tunggu stood as one of the few safe places in the lands of the current or former kingdom of Ava. Refugees began flooding Tunggu, which was a boon for the small, sparsely populated province. Refugees also meant harboring some of the rebellious enemies of Ava, something that Ming Yi Niao likely noticed, but pretended not to. To secure the loyalty of his most powerful governor, King Narapati II of Ava decided to give his first cousin away in marriage to Ming Yi Niao. At the marriage of Thiri Maha Sanda Dewi and Ming Yi Niao, King Narapati gifted all his remaining land that rested on the Sitang River, plus some. This included the recently reincorporated Yamathan, as well as the Kayaska Granary District, just south of Ava City. The farmland around the Kayaska Granary was some of the best agricultural land in all of Ava, yielding more than enough bundles of rice to supply Tunggu's swelling population of refugees. Tiny Tunggu had nearly doubled its size, and more times over, multiplied their annual revenue. King Narapati II had thought that this would guarantee Ming Yi Niao as a reliable vassal. But all he had really done was give away his most valuable land to a man 
who was plotting his own downfall. Only two years after the marriage and land concessions, Ming Yi Niao formally betrayed Eva. In 1504, he entered into an open alliance with the neighboring king of Prom, Thado Minsaw, the former vassal and current enemy of Eva. The so-called loyal governor had finally shown his true colors. Tunggu was now all but an independent state, with Ming Yi Niao at its head. The southern invasion of the newly aligned Prom and Tunggu began a few months later and lasted for nearly an entire year. Although weakened, the king of Ava held out against these attacks and managed to keep his former vassals at bay until the wet season pushed for their retreat. In the next year of 1505, the king of Prom made yet another alliance, this time with Saolin Amoyin, a leader of a newly created confederation of Shan states. This patchwork of ethnically Shan, Chinese, and Siamese towns, villages, and cities had found a competent leader to unite them and focus their combined might on their former overlord. Ava was now caught in a pincer from north to south, made possible by the diplomacy of Thado Minsa of Prom. Not skipping a beat, Thado Minsa and Saolin begin their own invasion of Ava. The pair raided deep into Ava from opposite sides and nearly met in the middle. Had they met, it might have spelled the end of Ava. The forces of Naropati II barely managed to outlast the combined invasion until the rescue of the wet season came in the following year of 1506. The yearly raids of Prom continued in 1507, this time enlisting the help of their Tonggu ally. Again, the raids pushed deep into Ava until the relief of the rainy season in 1508. The dual alliance of Prom and Tengu attacked again in 1509, but this time, it was different. What were simply yearly raids had culminated into an outright conquest. Prom captured more land north and along the Irrawaddy River, while Tengu filled out their own western border with Prom. On October 16th of 1510, Ming Yi Niao formally declares the independence of Tunggu from Ava. Even though the overlord and subject had been at war for the past six years, to accompany the creation of this new kingdom, Ming Yi Niao built another grand city along the Sitang River, this one being only a few miles north of Tunggu City. The city would take the name of the Buddhist paradise on earth, Ketumati. It would later become the modern-day city of Tonggu, after the former's destruction in the coming century. With a palace even grander than the last one built at Dwayawadi, there was now no way to question it. This was the home of a king. After the completion of Katumati, Ming Yi Niao formally crowned himself as the independent king of Tonggu. On April 11th of 1511, Ming Yi Niao became the first king of the Tonggu dynasty. No one, not even Ava, contested this action. As Prom and the Shan states continued in unending warfare against the kingdom of Ava, King Ming Yi Niao's reign was the most peaceful of all of Ava's former territories. For 15 whole years, there was no military incursion made in or out of Tonggu. Tonggu became an even more attractive spot for refugees from the wars to the north, swelling the manpower of the new kingdom. The long peace finally came to an end in 1525. In March of 1525, the combined forces of the Shan states and Prom probed deep into Ava, their armies meeting near the city of Ava itself. They promptly began a siege and sacked much of the city, with only the palace walls managing to hold out. A last-ditch attempt from King Naripati II of Ava to reassemble his kingdom would see him try to regain the whole of Tunggu province. The choice to focus on a sneak attack against Tunggu and not Prom or the Shan states was a bold move, but probably his best option. A month after the sack of Ava, in April of 1525, King Naripati II marched on Tunggu and besieged Ming Yi Niao at his capital of Ketumati. The 65-year-old king, after 15 years of passivity, 
easily led a successful defense of his capital, and the Avens retreated within a month. Although defeated, King Narapati did manage to recapture the lush lands around the Kayakska granary. Tungu and its king returned to their peaceful neutrality. Two years later, the final nail in the coffin was hammered into the kingdom of Ava. Prom and Saolin Shan states attacked the kingdom for the final time. This campaign would see another siege of the capital and its eventual fall. King Narapati II of Ava would die in the city's defense as the final king of a 163-year dynasty that ruled over much of modern Myanmar. The son of Salen, Thohenboa, was then crowned as the new Shan King of Ava. Most of the former Avon lands fell under the domain of King Thohenboa, with Prom annexing only a bit of land to their north. Ava had fallen. A new ethnic group, the Shan, had taken over in their place. This led the Burmese majority of Ava to retreat into the most stable kingdom in the region, the peace-loving realm of King Mingyi Niao's Tunggu. These new refugees would have some obstacles in their way to Tunggu, however. King Mingyi Niao worried that Saolin and his Shan states wouldn't stop at their conquest of Ava. In a preemptive defensive action, the king ordered for his northern borderland to be laid waste to. Trees were cut down, dams were flooded, wells were poisoned, and the population was evacuated. The attack from Saolin never came, but King Mingyi Niao was prepared nonetheless. Three years later, on November 24th of 1530, King Mingyi Niao would pass away at the age of 71 in his capital city. He would be succeeded by his only son, Taban Shwedi. Mingyi Niao was as shrewd politically as they ever came. From his early grasp at power with the assassination of his uncle and all the way to his patient and perhaps overdue independence from Ava. Where others were eager to split from Ava as fast as possible, the founder of the Tungu dynasty waited for the perfect moment to separate from his overlord. His 20-year reign as a king would see Tungu become an island of stability in a Burma plagued by systemic warfare. His realm provided a safe place for the Burmese culture to reside in as their kingdom was destroyed. At the start of his reign as governor, Tungu was a small, backwater, and underdeveloped province. By the end of his life, Tungu held the majority of the Sitong River and was among the most prosperous lands in all of Myanmar. Taban Shwedi, the first Tungu emperor and the conquering unifier of most of modern-day Myanmar, was born in the early spring of 1516. His 56-year-old father, a man named Niao, was the first king of the recently independent Tungu. He was the first child of Niao, and his only son. Despite being father to one of Southeast Asia's arguably greatest conquerors, Niao was one of the most peace-loving kings in the region. Taban Shwedi's name literally translates to Unitary Golden Umbrella, which sounds strange, but the umbrella has long been a symbol of power and nobility in Burma. The unitary portion of his name created something of a prophecy for this future king, as if it was his responsibility to pick up the pieces of the broken Burmese kingdom of Ava and unify all of Myanmar as it had been under the kings of Bagan. From a young age, the prince was believed to be the reincarnation of a vengeful prince of Hanthawadi named Bala Kintwa. The prince was wrongfully executed on the orders of his own father, King Razadirit, for plotting a takeover of Hanthawadi. Before his scheduled execution, the prince gave a long speech with his last words being, If I am guilty of treason by thought, word, or deed, may I suffer in the fires of the nether regions for a thousand cycle time. If I am innocent, may I be reborn in the dynasty of Ava kings, and may I become the scourge of my father. There was only one problem with this so-called prophecy. 
After 1527, there was no kingdom of Ava left that could become the scourge of Hanthawadi. The prophecy only states that Balakintwa be reborn in the dynasty of Avon kings, and well, Tabin Shwedi's mother was a cousin of the last king of Ava. Now he just needed to become the scourge of Hanthawadi, but first the prince needed some growing up to do. His education and informative care were entrusted in the hands of seven tutors, five male and two female servants. Two of these servants, one a man named Sway and the other a woman named Shin, were a married couple and would come to have a total of four children together. The firstborn son of the couple was born only three months before Tabin Shwedi. He was named Yi Hut. His mother Shin was to act as Tabin Shwedi's wet nurse and the prince grew up alongside the slightly older Yi Hut. Tabin Shwedi's first experience with warfare was when the last king of Ava, Minkong II, besieged the capital city of Tonggu that the nine-year-old prince called home. For the king of Ava, reclaiming Tonggu province was a last-ditch effort to reunify his broken land. Tonggu's walls held firm and King Niel's stubbornness held even firmer, as Minkong II was forced to retreat back to Ava in under a month's time. In a short two years after the siege, a confederation of Shan peoples in northern Burma killed Minkong II and brought all of Ava into their confederation. With the fall of Ava, there was nothing in between this warlike confederacy and the fledgling kingdom of Tonggu. Tabin Shwedi and his two years younger half-sister, Thakin Giyu, continued growing up alongside his crib mate, Yithut, along with his five other siblings. Tabin Shwedi was forced to learn quickly about what it took to be king of the precariously positioned Tonggu. His father, Niao, grew older by the day. He, however, set a great example for Tabin Shwedi. King Niao welcomed all to Tonggu, who brought with them peace and wasn't afraid to mark his hands dirty if someone threatened the order of his kingdom. Niao was also an ardent Buddhist, who instilled within Tabin Shwedi a monk-like structure to his character. The prince was forbidden from all vices, leading a highly disciplined life made complete by frequent meditation, and he seemed to thrive in this state of clear-headedness. In 1530, this 14-year-old boy would become the second king of Tonggu, as the 71-year-old King Niao's long reign came to an end along with his life. A common opening act for new and untested kings was to make lifelong alliances by marrying into the noble class of foreign kingdoms. Tabin Shwedi took quite the opposite course, instead finding allies among those closest to him. The young king of Tonggu took two wives, both were the children of the seven servants that had tutored and raised him alongside their own children. One of these wives was named Kin Miat. She was the daughter of one of Tabin Shwedi's male servants, a man named Shin Nitta, who belonged to a family of minor village nobles from central Tonggu. His second and favorite wife was a year his elder and named Dama Dewi. She was the daughter of Sui and Shin, and the older sister of Tabin Shwedi's crib mate and best friend, Yit Hut. This marriage didn't secure any alliances outside of Tonggu, but it ensured that Tabin Shwedi would keep at least three of his servants that knew him so well as lifelong allies who shifted from taking care of Tabin Shwedi to acting as his royal advisors. On top of appointing his servants as royal advisors, he also raised Yit Hut, his brothers, and many other childhood friends to important roles in his court. In the grand scheme of things, the death of King Niao changed nothing, as Tabin Shwedi continued the same peaceful rule that his father was so notorious for. In 1532, this would all come under threat. The Confederation of Shan states responsible for conquering Ava would betray its long-standing ally, the Kingdom of Prom. Prom was also the neighbor and only ally of Tonggu. Prom's king was taken hostage whilst his son, Narapati, was left to rule as a vassal king of the Shan Confederation. This left Tonggu completely isolated, without a friend in the world. Tonggu's geography left it easily defensible, but it also boxed in the small nation. If Tabin Shwedi remained as stagnant as his father had been, this would likely spell the end of Tonggu. The only way out of this trap chokehold was to break out. The two possible targets for Tonggu was the obvious and looming threat of the confederated Shan states, which posed the most immediate danger. The second target was the kingdom of Hanthawadi to the south. 
King Neo, in his early years as governor, had made a habit of raiding the rich lands of Hantawadi. This ended when Hantawadi retaliated by sending a massive army upstream that nearly succeeded in capturing the city of Tungu. The advisors of Tabanshwadi and the king himself came to the conclusion that their best option for necessary expansion was to test their southern neighbor of Hantawadi. This decision to fight Hantawadi was made for a number of reasons, all of which revolve around the Sitang River that connected the two countries and acted as the heartline of Tungu. The Sitang River was also only a few miles away from the capital of Hantawadi, the city of Pegu. Hantawadi also controlled everything that came into the river by means of the Indian Ocean. If Tabanshwadi could conquer the rest of the southern Sitang River and gain access to Indian Ocean ports, then he could acquire weapons from the wider world and guarantee independence by means of gunpowder. Tabanshwadi also had the fortune of being the supposed reincarnation of Prince Balakantwa, the wrongfully executed Hantawadi prince that vowed vengeance in his next life. Leaving an open book justification for Tabanshwadi to begin his career as a warrior monk king. By 1532, Tungu hadn't made a foreign military incursion for 22 years. This, however, did not mean that Tungu citizens were newcomers to war. Most of Tungu's population were Burmese refugees from neighboring kingdoms that found themselves in a civil or outright warfare with one another. This bolstered population meant a bolstered and experienced military. Tabanshwadi's first military action was directed in the April of 1532. Taking 500 of his best cavalry south, along with 40 of his advisors, including his brother-in-law, Yit Hut, this small but dangerous retinue probed south into Hantanwadi. They met no resistance, as they continued along the banks of the Sitang River. The company stopped just outside the walls of Pegu. With the Shui Ma Da Temple, the tallest of its kind in Myanmar, well within eyesight. The king of Hantawadi, a man named Takayutbi, cared little about this armed foray so close to his capital. King Takayutbi was a careless boy king who simply had no desire in ruling Hantawadi, leaving the work to his vassals and advisors. The 1532 expedition to Pegu was little more than a small scale raid. But it showed Taban Shwedi and his generals that Hantawadi was weakly ruled and unresponsive to aggression. In Buddhist faith, karma is a driving factor when separating a good decision from a bad one. Some wait around for karma to go full circle, while others take it into their own hands. Yithut is one of those who takes action when he feels wronged. So, Yithut got back at Taban Shwadi for marrying his older sister. He fucked the king's sister, and he got caught doing so in April of 1534. This was an act of treason, and punishable by death. Taban Shwadi was forced into a hard decision. Appear strong, or let his best friend live. He chose the latter option, and spun the whole situation so that everybody won. Yithut had to marry Taban Shwedi's sister, Thakin Giyu. Yathut was also made a prince, receiving the title of Kwayatin Naratu, a name that would come to replace his birth name. With this happy family now brought together by growing up together and marrying each other's sisters, the king and the loyal Kwayatin Naratu could go back onto their warpath. From 1534 to 1537, Taban Shwedi and his generals sent small raids into Hantawadi, none of the parties numbering more than 8,000 men. Each year, they reached the walls of Pegu, and each year, they were turned back by the garrison. The kingdom of Hantawadi mustered no counterattack as Takayutbi sat ignorant in his palace. Pegu's walls were stronger than its leader. If they could just pinpoint their attack on the weak Takayutbi, then maybe Pegu would fall. Over the course of the next year, Tungu spies spread misinformation about the generals of Hantawadi. King Takayutbi believed the rumors and executed his best generals, including the man who had defended the walls of Pegu for the past four years. Tungu's armies marched down the Sitang River once more. King Takayutbi, without the guidance of his loyal counselors, was nothing, evacuating his capital city. In 1538, the Tungu simply walked into Pegu, its inhabitants not even putting up a fight. 
Takeyutbi was on the run. He split his forces in two, taking personal command of one-fifth of his army, that neared 20,000, as he planned to flee into the Indian Ocean and sail up the Irrawaddy River until reaching the city of Prome, which was controlled by his brother-in-law, Narapati, who himself was a vassal of the Shan states. The majority of his army would be led overland through a region notorious for steep cliffs and thick jungles. Takeyupi's plan was solid. Getting the Shan states involved would surround Tongu by enemies on all sides. But first, he had to get to Prome. Taban Shwedi and Kwayat and Narada, formerly Yatut, both knew that they couldn't let the Hanthawadi reach Prome. Taban Shwedi ordered his brother-in-law to cut off the main Hanthawadi army. After a forced march, General Kwayat and Narada came upon the 16,000 strong army with its 4,000 men that were only separated by a river. The Hanthawadi not only outnumbered the Tungu drastically, but also outmatched them in terms of weaponry. The Hanthawadi possessed gunpowder weapons, Portuguese mercenaries, and Indian Rajput warriors. The Tungu held only their bows and steel. With all these advantages, the Hanthawadi were lacking in the most important factor of warfare, competent leadership. As Alexander the Great once said, I am not afraid of an army of lions led by a sheep. I am afraid of an army of sheep led by a lion. Taban Shwedi advised his brother-in-law not to attack. Quiet and Narada did not heed his advice. He constructed rafts and crossed the river. Once reaching the opposite side, he ordered for the rafts to be demolished and sent downstream, making a clear statement that his men would win or die. The Battle of Nyongyu started with Kwayatin breaking his force into three contingents, with himself leading the battle from the middle. Atop his war elephant, Kwayatin ordered a full frontal assault and charged towards the opposing commander atop his own elephant. The leading sheep general jumped from his elephant and fled the battle before Kwayatin could even reach him. The other, less cowardly sheep general was killed in battle during the initial charge. The leaderless Hanthawadi immediately began to rout and flee their foe that they outnumbered four times over. Most of the 16,000 died or surrendered, with a negligible force managing to reach the city of Prome. The Tungu had crushed the Hanthawadi army. Now they had free reign to conquer what was left of that kingdom. Taban Shwedi arrived at Nyangyu the next day, riding through fields of dead Hanthawadi until reaching his brother-in-law. Despite not listening to the king's advice to not attack the army, Taban Shwedi rewarded Kwayatin in the best way possible. First, he awarded him with lands to govern. Then, he gave the prince a new title, Bayanag. This translates to King's Older Brother, and made Bayanag not only the second most powerful man in Tungu, but also the direct successor to Taban Shwedi, even surpassing any future children the king may have. The trust shared between these two men must have been nothing less than pure confidence in one another. Chasing the remainder of the Hanthawadi army, Taban Shwedi and Bayanag besieged Prome. The siege lasted for a few months before being broken by an army sent by the Confederation of Shan States that Prome was subject to. Tungu retreated, deciding the time was nigh for Prome to join their cause. The Confederation generals followed before being stranded on an island and captured by the Tungu fleet. King Takayutbi attempted to convince the King of Prome and the Shan states to assist him in removing the Tungu. They both rejected and left Takayutbi to his own devices. Takayutbi decided to start rebuilding his army by capturing war elephants in the wilds of the Irrawaddy Delta. Soon after he began his excursion, the king suddenly died from an unknown illness in 1539 thus ending 200 unbroken years of Hanthawadi kings. With this, the prophetic last words of Prince Balakintwa were fulfilled by King Taban Shwedi. Upon hearing about the death of Takayutbi, Taban Shwedi confirmed the completion of the prophecy by naming Pegu as his new capital. With Pegu replacing Tungu as the seat of power, Taban Shwedi appointed a governor for Tungu in the form of Sue, the father of Bayanog, and tutor of Taban Shwedi. 
The king then made the wise decision to reappoint many of the same Hunthawadi, ethnically Mon, governors to the same posts that they had enjoyed during the reign of Takayutbi. Nearly all of Hunthawadi had fallen, with the exception of Mardaban, which was under the rule of Takayutbi's brother-in-law, Saabinya, who now styled himself as the new king of Hunthawadi, despite having no control over Pegu. Mardaban was by far the most defensible city in Hunthawadi lands, with walls so tall they were nearly unscalable, and so thick not even cannon could punch through them. Sabinya also bolstered his ranks by hiring a group of Portuguese mercenaries that would protect Martaban's river flank with a blockade of seven warships, armed to the teeth with cannon. To counteract these Portuguese mercenaries, Taban Shwedi hired his own Portuguese, 700 of them to be exact, armed with muskets and artillery. Portuguese were now fighting Portuguese for money. The mercenaries on both sides were happy to fight each other as long as they got paid doing it. In the fall of 1540, Taban Shwedi would conduct his first attack on Martaban. The Portuguese cannons did nothing against the walls of the city, and his fleet was matched and obliterated by the seven Portuguese warships blocking his path. Taban Shwedi withheld from more attacks, and instead decided to take the course of starving Martaban out. In the meantime, a Mon commander named Smim Payu, previously in the employment of King Takayutbi, petitioned for Taban Shwedi to keep trying to break the blockade of the river. His plan involved building fire ships and siege tower ships that steepled over the walls of Martaban. After seven months of siege, the second assault began. General Smim Payu led his fireboats to the seven Portuguese warships. Upon seeing their fate, three of the Portuguese boats slipped past and fled into the Indian Ocean. The other four boats could not escape, and three succumbed to the flames while the others surrendered. With the blockade broken, the bamboo raft siege towers made their way to the sea walls of Martaban. At the same time, Taban Shwedi attacked the front of the city, an explosion going off as the Tungu had mined and placed explosives under a portion of the wall, leaving a gap for the Tungu to pour in. The aquatic siege tower idea seemed to pay off, as the Tungu warriors fought hard to claim a section of the wall. Sabinya led a brave effort fighting alongside his men and expelling the Tungu, to no avail. The city was captured, Sabinya surrendered. Taban Shwedi congratulated him for his bravery and stubbornness before executing him, and every defender inside, sending a clear message that Taban Shwedi was the new king in town. Any Hunthawadi lords that hadn't already submitted to Tungu now raced to do so when they heard of the massacre at Martaban. The conquest of Hunthawadi was now complete, and stage one of Taban Shwedi's plan to save Tungu had been expertly fulfilled. Stage two would target the confederation of Shan states that only recently became Tungu's biggest threat. Tungu and the Shan had been at war since 1538, when the Shan forced Taban Shwedi to withdraw from Prome. Thereafter, Taban Shwedi defeated and captured six Shan generals on his run back to Tungu. Since then, the Tungu Shan War was put on the back burner by both sides until 1541. Tungu could finally turn their full attention back onto Prome. In recent years, both Prome and their Shan overlords had lost their leaders, with the Confederation's loss of Salin of Moyin being disastrous for the stability of the loosely associated states that he had brought together. His son, Thohenbois, became the new Confederation leader, although a much more weakened one at that, leaving Taban Shwedi in a perfect position to strike. The rainy season was not even over when Taban Shwedi launched his surprise attack on Prome. No one was prepared to meet him as the king and Bayanog led the land force whilst the Mon favorite of Taban Shwedi, Smim Payu, led the naval force up the Irrawaddy River. The plan was to take Prome before they even knew what hit them, and it almost succeeded. However, the king of Prome, Minkong, raised a last-minute army that garrisoned Prome and held off the Tungu until his Shan overlord, Thohenboa, came to the scene. Thohenboa arrived with a force to match Taban Shwedi in numbers, but not in leadership or technology. With his newfound access to the Indian Ocean, Taban Shwedi incorporated gunpowder tactics into his military. The Shan, on the other hand, were well behind in innovation. Taban Shwedi took the initiative, splitting his force into three, with himself in the middle 
Bayanog and his younger brother, Sithu, commanding the flanks. Bayanog and Sithu then executed a series of hit and runs with their cavalry that left the Shan cavalry, which they heavily depended on, in disarray. After three waves of attacks, the Shan cavalry were decimated. Tungu then sent their elephants to start the true battle, followed by cavalry, then the Tungu infantry. The battle was long and hard fought on both sides, though Henbo was forced to withdraw, defeated in the end. Later that year, Thohenboa would be assassinated, leaving the Shan a leaderless confederation. The fate of Prome was no longer within the grasp of their Shan overlord, but Prome was not alone quite yet. They still held an alliance with the powerful coastal kingdom of Arakan in the west. Arakan had stayed out of the affairs of their neighbors more often than not. Rarely did they leave the safety of their mountains that enclosed them to the ocean and their capital of Merakyu. Tungu was not so much afraid of the Arakanese army as they were terrified of their navy, which was and had been the dominant maritime power in Burma since the fall of the Bagan Empire a few centuries ago. The generals of Tungu were split on what course of action to take next. The Arakanese navy were more than capable to overrun the Irrawaddy Delta in mere weeks. Discussions on lifting the third siege of Prome were held, but came to a compromise. Tungu would keep a minimal number of forces to hold the siege of Prome, while directing the bulk of the army west and the bulk of the navy south to defend against Arakanese incursions. The Arakanese navy, led by their crown prince, Min Dika, laid waste to southern Tungu, capturing two important port cities in the midst of only a few days. The Arakanese army was not so lucky. Bayanog had set a trap. Sending fake prone messengers to the Arakanese army, he informed their general that the Tungu were vulnerable to attack through the Padong Pass. They took the bait. Bayanog orchestrated a perfect ambush, capturing nearly half of the Arakanese army in the process. Tungu never liked to play fair, but deception might just be a general's greatest weapon, as Bayanog and Tabanchwedi continue to show. The Arakanese navy withdrew, despite their continued gains. Prome was now alone. Taban Shwedi sent an ultimatum in May of 1542, demanding Minkong's surrender once again. This time, he accepted, and was spared his life by doing so. Taban Shwedi's other father-in-law was then made viceroy of Prome. After three sieges, Taban Shwedi had finally taken his neighbor. With the loss of Prome, the Confederation of Shan states finally sought to muster a counterattack. The Shan began a march south, successfully taking the countryside around the city of Prome. Prome proved to be just as difficult to attack for the Shan as it was for Tavan Shwedi. The attackers made no headway and retreated as the Tungu army was amassed and en route with cannon-manned warboats in tow. The Shan retreated all the way to their city of Salin. Here, they would make their stand. The fortifications of Salin only managed to last three days before Bayanog mined under a section of the wall and blew it to smithereens. The Tungu overran Salin and forced the Shan even farther north. In their haste, the Shan abandoned the city of Pagan. One of the most important cities in all of Burmese history was taken without a fight. Here at Pagan in 1544, where Taban Shwedi's ancestors once ruled as kings of all of Burma, Taban Shwedi was crowned in the traditions of those same ancestors, foreshadowing the events of more conquests to unify what was once the Pagan Empire. In the following year, the Shan attempted a counterattack, but were sorely defeated, their confederation falling into shambles as Tungu overtook the divided land up to Bagan, unifying it under their peacock banner. By 1545, central Burma was Taban Shwedi's alone, but he was not done yet. Later in 1545, Taban Shwedi took on a new wife, who would become his chief queen. She was of Mon origin, as Taban Shwedi appeared to try to appeal more towards these southern subjects than his own Tungu natives. This made sense, after all, as the Mon were the majority of his navy, and his admiralty, a navy that would undoubtedly be under fire from his next target, Arakan. King Min Bin of Arakan had assisted Prome against Taban Shwedi. Now it was time for them to pay. In 1545, Taban Shwedi was invited into Arakan by the Viceroy of Thandwe, who feared that he may lose his governorship of his province. A 4,000-strong Tungu force was then sent to Thandwe, hoping for an easy conquest of southern Arakan. They found nothing of the sort, 
and were easily defeated by the Royal Arakanese military. The Arakanese then recaptured Thundwe province, reinstating a loyal viceroy who would serve the king. Arakan showed that they were a far tougher nut to crack than their weakened or already subjugated neighbors. Tabanchwedi took another swing at Arakan in the following year, gathering a much larger force to bring down the kings of Mrak Yu. The Arakanese Tungu border was mountainous and far too treacherous for a large army to pass through, lest they fall victim to an ambush. 4,000 would take the land route into southern Arakan as they had in the previous year, while another 15,000 soldiers would be transported to meet them on the coast. By this point, Taban Shwedi had built his navy up enough to compete with that of his Arakanese foe, making this landing far easier than it may have been in previous years. The plan went off without a hitch, as Tungu took Thandwe after a minor siege. Taban Shwedi sat on this much-needed victory for a few months before restarting the invasion in 1547. The target of this campaign was the capital of Mrak Yu, and a total conquest of Arakan. The generals of Tungu had quite the challenge ahead of them, as they faced a foe just as well equipped as them with an arguably better trained navy. The Tungu reached a few miles outside of Mrak Yu when the Arakanese began to show a stout resistance. Encapsulating the capital was a series of 11 forts that would block any would-be conquerors, most impressive among them being Langyut, which was for a time the capital of Arakan. This impressive fort was fought over and eventually won by the Tungu, who used Portuguese cannon to bring down a part of the wall. Four more forts fell into Tungu hands as the path to Mrak Yu was cleared by gunpowder. The Tungu marched on Mrak Yu, setting up for what they hoped would be a short siege. In a few days, the Tungu gained a foothold on the eastern walls of the city. On the brink of victory, Arakan opened the floodgates, cutting the rest of Mrak Yu off, ceasing the siege in its tracks and forcing the Tungu to eventually withdraw. Negotiations were opened and both sides sought a peaceful resolution that resulted in what was a status quo territorially. The seemingly invincible military expert that was Taban Shwedi had just failed two campaigns in a row, against the same foe nonetheless. These two losses can be explained by the absence of one general from these campaigns, Crown Prince Bayanog. Taban Shwedi would not make the same mistake of excluding his heir apparent on his next planned campaign, the conquest of Thailand. Turning from west to east, Taban Shwedi targeted Thailand on the basis that Thai soldiers had made incursions into what Taban Shwedi considered the Tungu portion of the Malay Peninsula. In the years leading up to the Tungu declaration of war, Thailand was a place of chaos, where kings were assassinated and advisors held the power of the state. Corruption was commonplace, and from the outside, Thailand appeared as if it could be another Hanthawadi, where easy conquest was the order of the day. The war started in 1547, Taban Shwedi sending an army and navy to dislodge any Thai forces already in his lands. Going further south still, the Tungu conquered a chunk of Siam along the Indian Ocean. The invasion of mainland Thailand started a year later in 1548. With three armies of 4,000 soldiers each, the Tungu set course to the Thai capital of Ayutthaya, going through each of the three pagodas passes. The first and lead army was headed by Prince Bayanog. Accompanying him was his firstborn son and the future king, Nanda. The center army was led by King Taban Shwedi himself. The rear guard of the Tungu was led by Taban Shwedi's two tutor father-in-laws. The armies of Taban Shwedi met very little backlash as they marched the whole way to Ayutthaya. Here, the three armies made camp outside of the walls and began preparing for a siege. Ayutthaya was no easy task. It sat alone on an island in the middle of three flowing rivers. Surrounding these rivers was a swamp where large siege works could do nothing but become stuck in the mud. Instead of sticking behind his walls, the king of Ayutthaya, Maha Chakarapat, marched with an army to turn the Burmese back from where they had come. His gamble outside the walls of Ayutthaya would prove to change his life forever. A bloody battle ensued. Bayanog, commanding the left flank, did his part in decimating his Thai counterpart. Taban Shwedi, situated on the right flank, managed to send his enemy into flight where they ran behind the walls of Ayutthaya. The central portion of both armies was still embroiled in conflict. At the center of this fight was an elephant duel. 
the king of Thailand himself, fought the father-in-law of Tabanchwedi, Thado Damayaza, the governor of Prome. During this duel, the Thai king's elephant panicked and began to run from the battlefield. The governor of Prome, in turn, started to chase after the king. This is when a member of the royal Thai household, atop their own elephant, stepped forward and placed themselves in between their king and Thado Damayaza. This duel ended shortly after it had initiated. Thado Damayaza killed the two soldiers who rode atop. When their bodies shrugged to the ground, one of their helmets fell off, revealing long black hair and a face of a woman. Queen Sirio Tai had just given her life to ensure the safety of her husbands. Word spread fast on the battlefield as King Maha regained control of his elephant and ordered an organized retreat behind the walls of Ayutthaya. The siege of Ayutthaya was nothing short of a disaster for Tabanshwedi and his esteemed generals. They made no headway on the seemingly impenetrable island fortress before another Thai army arrived from the south to relieve their capital. Under the council of Bayanog, the disgruntled Tabanshwedi decided to start his withdrawal in defeat. Four years of failed campaign had taken a toll on the king and the economy. In order to not leave Thailand empty-handed, Taban Shwedi decided to siege the city of Kaping Pat on his return trip. This ancient city would have easily fallen to the armies of Tanggu, had they not been housing a host of Portuguese mercenaries that held off Taban Shwedi until a Thai force sent by their king had arrived to chase the retreating Burmese. The Thai army was controlled by two princes, who proceeded in harassing the Tunggu invaders for three days. The two princes were so close to Taban Shwedi that their eagerness led to their downfall. When the princes split their forces in two, Taban Shwedi pounced, entrapping the princes and defeating their armies, before taking the two princes as valuable prisoners of war. The Tunggu weren't going home empty-handed now, but with two bargaining chips. After this disastrous battle, King Maha Chakarapat of Thailand pressed for Taban Shwedi to return his heir and son. Negotiations opened as Taban Shwedi agreed to return the two princely hostages and other POWs in exchange for two large war elephants and an annual tribute of 30 elephants in gold. To show his dominance and confidence, Taban Shwedi then ordered his army to rest for eight days in Thailand before peacefully returning to his Burmese homeland. Whilst the invasion of Thailand held mixed results, it was a victory compared to the previous Air Kniz campaign. Tunggu added only the small chunk of territory that they had conquered in 1547, but one renown and a fresh supply of war elephants. Shortly after the campaign, Bayanog's father, Sui, who was the governor of Tunggu province, passed away, leaving Taban Shwedi to appoint his son and Bayanog's half-brother, slash cousin, Minkong, as the new governor of the homeland. By this point in 1550, the 33-year-old Taban Shwedi had spent his entire life since a teenager at war. While he was mostly successful, especially in his initial burst onto the scene, the past five years of campaigning had been hard on the king. The monk-like king broke character, turning to the bottle to soothe his mind. Taban Shwedi had spent his entire life without vice, but all it took was one sip of Madeira wine from one of his Portuguese mercenaries to turn the monk into nothing more than a drunk. Alcohol had turned him into a layabout, as the king handed over all the responsibility of rule over to Bayanog. Bayanog attempted to save his lifelong best friend, bribing the hired winemaker and sending him away. From here, Bayanog tried to persuade Taban Shwedi, but to no avail. The king was lost. The people of his empire started to realize this, as the brother of King Takiyutbi of Hantawadi, a man named Smim Hatwa, began to revolt against the rule of Tonggu. Bayanog needed to act quickly in the absence of the usually active Taban Shwedi. Bayanog, who was all but king in name now, then began his chase of the rebellious Hanthawadi pretender. Whilst Bayanog was off campaigning, Taban Shwedi was whoring, drinking, and hunting. While celebrating his 34th birthday, on the night of April 30th, 1550, the governor of Sitang, named Smim Sahut, ordered his men to break into the tent where Taban Shwedi slept. He was decapitated in his sleep and never felt a thing. In Burmese Buddhist culture, Taban Shwedi 
is one of the 37 gnats. The gnats are something similar to Christian saints. Ultimately, Tabanshwari is still worshipped to this day in this format by Burmese soldiers and those who seek help in addiction. The story of Tabanshwari is one of the underdog. Tungu would only be a footnote in the story of Burma if it was not for his campaigns that turned the small city-state into an empire. While Tabanshwari was a political and military mastermind in his own right, the credit must be shared with his best friend and chosen heir, Bayanog, who is now left in the middle of the jungle while the empire that he had helped build completely fell apart. The year is 1550. The crown prince of the Tungu Empire, a man named Bayanog, is hunting down a rebellious governor named Smimhatwa in the south of the empire. The clever pretender king has managed to evade the military mastermind that is Bayanog for three whole months. On April 30th of 1550, Taban Shwedi, the current emperor of Tungu, was assassinated on his 34th birthday. By all means, the crown should have effortlessly passed to Bayanog, the best friend and closest advisor to Tavan Shwedi. Instead, there was only chaos, as every single province in the recently created Tungu Empire chose to rebel against their new emperor. Bayanog was now alone in the jungle, chasing a ghost, with only 2,000 loyal soldiers at his command. His situation was beyond bleak, but the man known to history as the conqueror of the Ten Directions, would reclaim his kingdom and form the largest empire ever seen in the history of Southeast Asia. He was, in every sense of the term, a king without a kingdom. Bayanog had to act quick to reclaim his rightful throne. He immediately ends his three-month chase of Smimhatwa and begins his reunification campaign by marching on the heart and namesake of the empire, the province of Tungu. There was only one problem with this plan. Tungu's new king was Bayanog's half-brother, Minkong. Bayanog was also faced with the challenge of marching to Tungu through miles of rebellious lands, including the old capital of Pegu, which had fallen into the hands of Tabanshwedi's assassin. When Smim Sahut saw Bayanog's small retinue approaching, he gathered his own army and prepared to face him in open battle. Bayanog ordered his men to not even look at the opposing force marching in their direction. When Smim Sahut figured out that Pegu was not the goal of Bayanog, he thought it better not to engage the experienced commander. Bayanog and his 2,000 men harmlessly marched past Pegu, continuing their path onto Tungu province. Bayanog marched until reaching only a few miles outside of Tungu city. When the citizens heard of the return of the king's older brother, many people from all backgrounds raced to join his force. Among them being Bayanog's wife, his daughter, and his eldest son, an heir apparent of the fractured empire, Prince Nanda. By August of 1550, his ranks had been bolstered to number nearly 10,000 men and 200 warboats, much better than the 2,000 he had started with. On September 2nd, he mobilized his new army and besieged his younger brother in the city of Tungu. Minkong managed to hold out against his four brothers for four months before he surrendered. Finally, in January of 1551, Bayanog had reclaimed the city that he had grown up in. As for his rebellious brother, Bayanog chose to forgive him, reuniting the five siblings under a common cause. After capturing the city, Bayanog formally coronated himself as king. However, the work to reunify the Tungu Empire was nowhere near complete. The five brothers planned for their next target, choosing nearby Prom, under the rule of Tabanshwedi's father-in-law, Thado Damayaza. This choice came from a place of geography. Controlling Prom meant that Bayanog could take central command of the two rivers that ran through Burma, the Sitang and the mighty Irrawaddy. After three months of consolidating his rule around Tungu and accepting the surrender of much of the northern section of the empire, who had stayed neutral in the civil war, 
Thyanog mustered an army to besiege Prome for the fourth time in his life. The siege began in March, but the city managed to hold out as it always had. The pretender king inside was a much more challenging opponent than Bayanog's disloyal brother. Thado Damayaza was an experienced general in his 50s, who was made famous in challenging the king of Thailand to an elephant duel. The Thai king ran while his wife blocked the pursuing Thado Damayaza. He then cut down the queen in his place. Bayanog withdrew and regrouped his force, besieging Prome for the fifth and final time. The siege was off to a bad start. The walls held firm and the garrison stubborn. They needed a miracle to reclaim the city, and a miracle they got. Ming Kong, the once traitorous brother of Bayanog, mounted his war elephant and started to charge. Disregarding his own safety, he rammed the gate with his elephant at full speed. The gate collapsed, and the Tungu warriors charged in just behind him. The city was captured, and Thado Damayaza attempted to flee, but was caught along the way. Ming Kong had just proven that he would be nothing but loyal to Bayanog from this point onward. Bayanog was now left with a hard decision. He had spent many of his early and adult years around Thado Damayaza, who had been nothing but good to him up until this point. He viewed the man as something of an uncle figure. Where Bayanog forgave and pardoned his brother, the same treatment was not extended to Thado Damayaza. He executed the man. Bayanog immediately regretted this decision and carried this on his shoulders for the rest of his life. He then appointed his brother, whose name was also Thado Damayaza, as Viceroy of Prome. After the conquest of Prome, Bayanog quickly turned his army to reconquer Pagan, one of the most important centers of Burmese culture. The city was ruled by a man named Sakate, who had taken advantage of the power vacuum left by the late Tabanshwedi. He commanded very little power outside of the city itself, and was far less of a challenge as Pagan fell in just a week to Bayanog. The northern borders of Tabanshwedi's empire had been restored, but Bayanog continued marching north towards the city of Ava and into the heart of the Shan Confederacy. He nearly reached the city before hearing the news. Smim Hatwa, the man who Bayanog was initially chasing when Tabanshwedi was assassinated, began a march on Tongu. By this point, Smim Hatwa had consolidated his rule over much of Hantawadi. In August of 1550, he defeated and killed the assassin of Tabanshwedi, Smim Sahut, subsequently conquering the capital city of Pegu. Bayanog returned in haste to defend Tongu. Smim Hatwa withdrew to Pegu once hearing of the emperor's return. Bayanog gave chase and reached the walls of Pegu by March 12th of 1552. Smim Hatwa, no longer running from Bayanog, exited the walls of his city atop a war elephant. Gesturing towards Bayanog, he challenged him to single combat. Bayanog accepted and confidently rode upon his own elephant to finally meet Smim Hatwa face to face. The duel was brief. Bayanog an expert warrior, managed to scare Smim Hatwa so much that he fled the scene. Pegu was taken, and the capital was finally in the hands of Bayanog. Smim Hatwa, in a common sight, was on the run. He abandoned his wife and his army. The fleeing king managed to evade capture for an entire year before the Tungu captured and executed the pretender. With that, Bayanog reclaimed Hantawadi and fully restored the empire of Tabanshwedi to its former glory. Keep in mind that he did this in only two short years, where it had initially taken 13. After this, he named his brother, Minyi Sithu, as the governor of Martaban province. With his empire restored, Bayanog can now refocus his attention north, towards the Shan states. In the summer of 1553, he sent an army led by his 15-year-old son, Prince Nanda perhaps as an attempt to test his military merit. The Shan, however, were prepared to meet the prince, gathering a force sizable enough for Nanda to call off the invasion before it had even begun. This would be the first of many military setbacks in the life of Nanda. Whilst his son was on campaign, Bayanog was on his own campaign of sorts. 
beginning a building project of a new royal palace in the capital city of Pegu. By January of 1554, it was completed, and in front of this elaborate palace, Bayanog formally crowned himself as the Tungu Emperor. With his position of King of Tungu now thrown to the side, he named his once traitorous brother, Minkong, as the Viceroy of Tungu Province, showing that the trust between the two siblings was now without a doubt. With Prince Nanda's withdrawal from his Shan campaign, the horse lords to the north were still one of Bayanog's biggest threats. Assembling an army of some 20,000, Bayanog split his army in two. One army led by Minkong would advance on the city of Ava from Tungu Province while another army, led by Thado Minsa, would advance on the banks of the Irrawaddy River from Pagan and meet his brother at the city of Ava. Commanding 200 warboats that would sail up the Irrawaddy was the governor of Prome, Thado Damayaza. The fourth and final brother of Bayanog would stay behind in Martaban in case the Thai got any ideas. Bayanog would station himself in his new capital along with Nanda, prepared to meet Arakan if they too saw this as an opportune moment to invade. The Confederation of Shan states prepared to meet the armies of Tungu once more. This time, the Tungu would not tuck tails and run. The three brothers advanced on Ava as planned and besieged the city. With their superior firepower in the form of cannons and firearms purchased from Portuguese traders, they took the city of Ava in January of 1555. With the city's capture, the youngest brother of Bayanog, Thado Minsa, was given his own province to govern over with his seat being the city of Ava. The campaign paused for only a brief moment before the three brothers turned north yet again. Continuing up the banks of the Irrawaddy River, they proceeded in their crushing victories over the Shan states, allowing for the conquest of even more of their land. With this, the initial campaign against the Shan states was put on a successful hold. The brother governors returned to their respective provinces, and Bayanog held on to peace for the better part of a year. Over the course of that peaceful year, the Shan state of Mong Nai, one of the most powerful members of the confederation, decided to join Tungu, fearing their impending conquest. On a more tragic note, the brother of Bainog and governor of Martaban, Min Yi Sithu, died of unknown causes. He was succeeded by his son as viceroy. The five brother generals would never enjoy another campaign altogether, but the four remaining ones would continue to conquer with his memory behind them. In 1557, Bayanog gathered his largest army yet, some 30,000 men, to invade the Confederation of Shan states. Commanded by his three brothers yet again, along with Prince Nanda, the army went north and faced little resistance. The Shan chiefs and kings submitted to Tungu without a fight, until they reached Hisapa. Here, the Confederation gave their last serious stand, but were defeated by overwhelming odds and gunpowder. By November of 1557, Bayanog had nearly conquered all the confederation, with only a small number of Shan states managing to evade conquests in the far northeast. He was now the undisputed ruler of central Burma. This would not go unchallenged, however, as Mong Nai, who had submitted peacefully to Tungu in 1556, revolted. The brother of the ruler of Mong Nai was Makuti, the king of Lan Na a regional power to the east that commanded much respect. King Makuti supported his brother's war to reclaim Mong Nai, sending in the soldiers of Lan Na. Bayanog, in a display of strength, personally commanded an army that put down this rebellion, showing that he was not one to be trifled with, destroying the armies of Lan Na and Mong Nai in mere months before executing the ruler of Mong Nai. With that, the Shan were back under the control of Bayanog, which meant that he could now incorporate the Shan army into his own. While the Shan infantry was lacking and their navy near nothing, the Shan cavalry was likely the greatest in Southeast Asia. Their horses were much bigger than native Burmese ones, and their men grew up in the saddle, much like a steppe nomad of Central Asia would. With the Shan cavalry incorporated into the gunpowder tactics of the Tungu army, this combination would prove to be a near unstoppable wrecking ball across Indochina. With the Shan subdued, the campaign of 1557 came to a halt. The brothers of Bainog went back to the drawing board to plan their next conquest. Lan Na had proven that they would not accept Tungu hegemony, 
and King Makuti's involvement in the Mong Nai Rebellion was an unforgivable act that could not go unchallenged. For this campaign, the three brothers of Bainog and Prince Nanda led their own armies, while Bainog himself commanded the main army. In 1558, the invasion began and arrived at the Lan Na capital of Chiang Mai at the end of March. Bayanog offered King Makuti a peaceful surrender and gave him three days to deliberate. On the second day, King Makuti chose to surrender and was spared his life. He was then brought back to Pegu, where he pledged to become one of Bayanog's vassal kings. Shortly after the Tungu armies returned from the Lan Na campaign, something unexpected happened. One of the most powerful kings in Laotian history, Sedathirith of Langzhang, invaded Lan Na and took the eastern half of the newly incorporated kingdom. For a short five years before Makuti, Sedathirith was the king of Lan Na, before coming to rule Langzhang. However, he stayed in Langzhang for far too long, and the nobles of Lan Na chose Makuti as their new king. Now, Sedathirith was here to reclaim his lost throne from the foreign invader that was Bayanog. By this point in 1558, the bulk of the Tungu army was in the northeast, conquering one of the leftover Shan states of Hesenwi. They succeeded in this, but were now faced with the prospect of defeating an invasion from Langzhang. Bayanog called upon his brother, Thado Minsa, to expel Sedathirith from Lan Na. After a few months of grueling combat with the forces of Langzhang, Thado Minsa managed to force Sedathirith back into the Laotian jungles by the end of 1558. With this nuisance put to the side, the campaign to finally end the Shan Confederation was resumed. When the Tungu armies arrived at the doorsteps of the Shan rulers, they submitted to Tungu one by one. Now the Confederation of Shan states, that had been the premier power in northern Burma for two centuries, were finally subdued by the men of Myanmar. His northern flank was now completely secured by mountains on every side. However, there was still one small problem here. The Hindu kingdom of Manipur to the west had territorial claims on one of the previous Shan states, named Kale. When Tungu conquered Kale, Manipur did not relinquish their territorial claim, leaving a good casus belli for Bayanog to add more land to his expanding domain. In December of 1559, the invasion began, but this army was unlike any Tungu army before it. It was barely even ethnic Burmese or Mon. Instead, it was made up of almost all Shan men. Putting these new conscripts to the use, nearly 10,000 Shan crossed the border into Manipur, and for the first time, a Tungu army entered the Indian subcontinent. In two months, the city of Manipur surrendered, and the rest of the kingdom fell along with it. Now, on top of Shan soldiers, Bayanog also incorporated ethnically Hindu warriors into his military. With this explosion of conquest, Bayanog decided to sit on his victories for two years, from 1560 to 1562. However, he was only postponing more conquest to prepare for his most ambitious campaign yet, the conquest of Thailand. Bayanog had once assisted Taban Shwedi in his attempt to take the kingdom of Siam, their armies on the very doorstep of victory at the Thai capital of Ayutthaya before being forced to withdraw when the rainy season arrived. The Tungu Empire was in a far more favorable position to conquer Thailand this time around. With the conquest of Lan Na, the Burmese now surrounded Thailand on two different fronts. The campaign to take Thailand started in the exact same way that Taban Chwedi's campaign started. A Tungu army marched on the city of Tavoy on the Malay Peninsula, managing to take it without the Thai responding. Taking this city allowed Bayanog to cut mainland Thailand off from its provinces in the Malay Peninsula, cutting the kingdom nearly in two. Before starting the proper invasion of Siam, Bayanog first wanted to secure his northern flank from the Shan to the far northeast. These Shan were mostly made up of ethnically Chinese and differed slightly in culture from the members of the confederated Shan states. Bayanog sent his three brothers and Prince Nanda north to subdue them. Kentung surrendered without a fight, while the other Chinese Shan put up more of a resistance. However, the Tungu easily defeated and subjugated their lands over the span of a few weeks. 
After a census was conducted over his newly acquired lands, Bayanag assembled his largest army to date, numbering some 50,000 men. From here, he demanded from the king of Thailand, Maha Chakarapat, two of his prized white elephants. Pound for pound, these albino beasts were more valuable than gold and more precious than silk. Maha Chakarapat refused, and with that, Bayanag set course to conquer Thailand in November of 1563. On course with the previous campaign, the main army, led by Bayanog, crossed the border through the Three Pagodas Pass, while another army, led by his brother, Thado Minsa, entered Thailand further north, using the Mao Lame Pass. A third army, led by the vassal king of Lan Na, Makuti, would enter Thailand from the north. The invasion was off to a bad start, as King Makuti refused to join Bayanog's campaign, instead revolting and allying himself with King Satathirath of Langjiang for protection. Frustrated but not yet defeated, Bayanag continued his Siamese campaign without the forces of Lan Na. He first battled the governor of Fitzanaluk, whom he defeated in open battle. The governor then fled behind the walls of his city, where he soon surrendered to Bayanag and agreed to assist him in his campaign. After this, the armies moved south, inching their way ever closer to Ayutthaya. Blocking their path was the once mighty kings of Sukhothai, who had fallen in recent centuries to become vassal kings of Siam. Their king, Thamaracha, submitted to Bayanag without a fight, and also joined him in his conquest, swelling his already massive army to nearly 60,000 men. From here, Bayanag marched on Ayutthaya, hoping to succeed where he and Tabanshwedi had failed. In front of them was the obstacle of a capital surrounded by rivers and a swamp around that, with three Portuguese warships protecting the harbor. After a few weeks of exchanging artillery with the fortress and the warships, the Burmese managed to capture the Portuguese boats, leaving the path to conquer Ayutthaya wide open. Bayanag ordered a non-stop artillery barrage on the city itself that lasted for days killing civilians and soldiers alike. After the bombardment ceased, King Maha Chakarapat came out of his capital under the white flag of truce. He surrendered and conceded to the demands of Bayanag. These included a yearly tribute of 300 pounds of silver, 30 war elephants every year, four white elephants, and the son of Maha Chakarapat, Ramaswan. Maha Chakarapat also had to abdicate his throne and become a monk in favor of his son, Mahinthrathirat. And lastly, Siam would become a vassal kingdom of Tungu, formally completing the conquest of Thailand. Siam was now Bayanag's puppet, but the campaign could not end here. There was still the problem of King Makuti of Lan Na, who had revolted against Bayanag at the start of the invasion. Bayanag then turned his army north to subdue Lan Na once again. The 60,000 strong army arrived at the Lan Na capital of Chiang Mai. The defenders inside needed no convincing of their impending doom and ran out of the city before a siege could even begin. King Makuti begged for Bayanog's mercy, which he granted and sent him to Pegu, where he would live out the rest of his days. In his place, Bayanog placed a new vassal ruler in Lan Na. A woman named Visu de Devi would become the new queen of Lan Na. After this, Bayanag was forced to return to Pegu, which had erupted into rebellion from Shan peoples that Bayanag had resettled in the capital. The Shan rebels burned down much of the city and the royal palace. Bayanag entered a scorched city as the rebels dispersed into the countryside. The capital would need rebuilding. Bayanag saw this as nothing more than an opportunity to flex his might. With Lan Na, Brought back under the fold of Tungu, there was only their ally to deal with, King Satathirath of Langjiang, a man who continued to be a thorn in the side of Emperor Bayanog. This time, Bayanog decided to invade Langjiang, lest he face more disruption in future campaigns. The army was to be headed by Crown Prince Nanda himself. Nanda had proven that he was capable of leading detachments of armies under the overall command of his father and uncles 
but he had never been the supreme commander of a campaign up until this point. He proved his merit as the son of Southeast Asia's greatest conqueror and took the Langjiang capital of Yantian in early 1565, although the war was not over. King Setathirath escaped into the jungles and continued harassing Tungu armies by use of guerrilla warfare. Nanda was forced to chase the king who evaded him at every turn, leaving his armies to face death by arrows that appeared from the midst of the jungle or by the simple harshness that is the land of Lao. Nanda gave up on capturing Setathirath and installed his son-in-law as the vassal king of Langjiang, although Setathirath still had nominal control over most of the kingdom, excluding Vientiane. Nanda returned to Pegu and brought with him many Langjiang nobles as hostages, including the brother and cousins of Setathirath. With Thailand conquered, Lan Na subdued, and Setathirath on the run, Bayanog found this opportunity to enjoy a rare peace. From 1565 to 1568, the Tungu armies went on no major campaigns, instead defending their borders from the likes of King Setathirath, who continued to grow in strength. Eventually in 1567, Setathirath besieged and retook his capital, expelling the Tungu from his lands. Meanwhile at Pegu, Bayanog was overseeing the rebuilding of his burnt city. He reconstructed his palace, this one even grander than the last. He even rebuilt the city walls, having 20 gates with five on each side of the gridded square. Each of these gates was funded and built by the 20 vassal rulers that Bayanog had gathered in his conquest. Each vassal ruler would enter through the respective gate when they were summoned to Pegu. To the north, there was Siam, Tenasiram, Martaban, Pagan, and Basan. To the east, there was Prome, Ava, Tungu, Dala, and Langjiang, in which no vassal king would enter for some time. To the south, there was Lanna, Momik, Moyen, Mogong, and Tavoy. And lastly, to the west, there was Kao, Mon, Niangshui, Therawadi, and Tani. These gates cemented Tungu's reign over the regions that they had conquered, as it was quite literally set in stone. In 1568, the deposed king of Siam, turned monk, Maha Chakarapat, was given permission by Bayanog to return to his homeland on grounds of a religious pilgrimage. He soon abandoned his Buddhist robes and retook the throne of Thailand from his son. He then formed an alliance with King Setathirath of Langjiang and prepared to get revenge on his subjects to the west who had flipped sides to Bayanog during his 1563 conquest of Siam. He targeted the governor of Fitsanilok and Sukhothai, Maha Thamaracha. Together, the Lao and Thai marched on the city and began to siege it. Bayanog responded by mustering another huge army, numbering some 70,000 men. Splitting his army in fifths, he entrusted himself, his three brothers, and his son to reclaim Thailand under the Tungu banner. One of the armies was sent to break the siege of Fitsanilok, but they could not defeat the besieging force of Ayutthaya and Vientiane. The Tungu army instead decided to break through the siege line and join the defenders inside. The combined and besieged garrison then plotted on how the siege could be broken. While they didn't have the numbers to sally out and defeat the army, they held the advantage of blocking off the river they sat on. Flaming rafts were then constructed in the city and sent downstream, much to the displeasure of the Thai fleet, which was all but destroyed by the flames. With that, the hopes of continuing the siege dwindled and both armies started to withdraw. The Burmese pursued the retreating armies, hopeful to catch one of them off guard, until they themselves were caught off guard by King Setathirath. The ambush turned into a slaughter, as the Tungu played directly into the hand of their opponent. With the Tungu army in the region put to the sword, the Thai returned to the sparsely defended city of Fitsanilok. The unprepared garrison was surprised, and the city fell to the Thai army. Another one of the five Tungu armies was defeated by the Laotians while marching on Ayutthaya. They were in turn defeated themselves by one of the three remaining armies and Setathirath was forced to withdraw to his domains in Langjiang. King Setathirath may have been defeated in the end, 
but he had just annihilated two Tungu armies and proved yet again that he was a formidable opponent. The three remaining armies marched on Ayutthaya and put the city to the siege. The Tungu attempted to mine under the walls and place explosives, but the Thai constantly sallied out to prevent them. There was also an attempt to build a bridge across the moat to reach the upper battlements of Ayutthaya. This too failed under constant harassment from the garrison. Sometime during the initial phases of the siege, the rebel king of Thailand, Maha Chakarapat, died of unknown causes. His son, who was formerly the vassal of Bayanog, retook his crown and took over the siege in his place. The Burmese attackers decided on a new course of action to take the city. A spy of Thai origins was sent into the city before opening the gates on the night of August 7th of 1569. The city was stormed and taken shortly after. King Mahanthrathirat was taken as a hostage and in his place, Bayanog chose to appoint the loyal governor of Fitzanalok, Maha Thamaracha, as the new king of Thailand. For Thamaracha, who belonged to the dynasty of Sukhothai, this was a return to a lost glory as they had controlled most of Thailand in the 13th century before becoming a vassal state of Ayutthaya. With the rebellious kings of Ayutthaya dethroned and dead, Bayanog could finally rear his attention back onto his biggest rival, the elusive king of Langjiang. After retreating to Vientiane in 1569, King Sadathirath gathered his treasury and armory, then he abandoned his capital altogether, taking his army with him into the Laotian countryside. He planned on beating the Tungu invasion as he had before, by use of guerrilla tactics and by the jungles of his country. Bayanog took personal command of the 1569 Langjiang campaign, marching with his brothers and his son into the Laotian countryside. When Minkong and his army arrived at Vientiane, he found the capital was barely defended and easily took it. The five armies then began their unsuccessful search for Setathirath. For an entire year, Tungu armies attempted to hunt him down. All the while, their men died from starvation and sheer exhaustion. In 1570, Bayanog called off the invasion and returned to Pegu. After the Tungu departure, Setathirath returned to Vientiane and retook his capital city. From here, the king of Langjiang developed a new strategy to defeat his Burmese rivals. In 1571, he began an invasion of Khmer. Controlling Khmer would give Setathirath not only access to Cambodian warriors and elephants, but also access to the ocean and by extension, access to gunpowder weapons that he could use to match the Tungu arsenal. A solid plan, but perhaps one that was too ambitious as the Khmer defeated the invasion and sent Setathirath packing. Setathirath went back to Langjiang. While he was gone, the nobles of his kingdom were plotting his overthrow. Upon his return, the 37-year-old warrior king of Langjiang was assassinated by his own people. He left behind one child to succeed him, a boy, who was born mere months before his father's untimely death. A regent would need to rule in his place for 18 years before he came of age. Setathirath's right-hand general, Sen Solintha, then led the Langjiang army back to the capital from the failed Cambodia campaign. He deposed the infant son of Setathirath and declared himself as the king of Langjiang. This move was unpopular among the Lao, and many refused to recognize the legitimacy of this usurper. With Bayanog's greatest rival dead, and Lang Zhang on the brink of civil war, the Burmese king thought it was due time to finally bring the kingdom of Lang Zhang into his empire. Another Tungu army was sent to Lao in 1572, this one only numbering 6,000 men, a far cry from the previous Tungu invasions. Sen Solintha easily defeated this negligible force before they could even reach Vientiane. The now furious Bayanog exiled this general in charge of the campaign, and immediately began to raise a new army to conquer Lang Zhang. This time, he would personally lead the invasion. When the call to assemble an army went out to his vassals throughout the empire, many of them could not meet the quota, their manpower having been sapped in the Laotian jungles. If Bayanog went forward with this conscription, 
there was a chance that his vassals would start to revolt. Frustrated, the emperor decided it better to wait a year before returning to Langzhang. Bayanog impatiently waited for 1574 before conscripting a new army. This time, many of the vassals came to him, their regiments full of a dwindling supply of good fighting men. However, his northernmost subjects, the Shan of Moyin and Mogong, refused to send soldiers and revolted against the emperor. They had revolted once before, in 1571, but were easily stomped out in that same year. Frustrated but still determined on the prize of Langzhang, Bayanog sent his brother, that Ominsa, to subdue the Shan Rebellion. Simultaneously, Bayanog took his new army and personally invaded Langzhang. The usurper king, Sen Solintha, evacuated Vientian and prepared to face Bayanog in another guerrilla campaign. He didn't get far before his own people, that despised him for stealing the throne, captured him and brought him to Bayanog. The Burmese emperor took the capital city and installed the brother Setathirath, who had been a hostage in Pegu since the initial Burmese invasion, as the new king of Langzhang. The Lao accepted him as their king, and after three failed invasions, the kingdom of Langzhang was now formally part of the Tungu Empire. Bayanog returned to Pegu, taking the usurper king back with him as a hostage. Bayanog had just created the largest empire ever to be seen in the history of Southeast Asia. And by extension, he had just become the greatest conqueror in the history of Southeast Asia. His domain stretching from the modern day country of Vietnam in the east to India in the west, and from the southernmost reaches of present day Thailand to China in the north. The northern Shan still remained in revolt, using the mountains of the Himalayas to conduct guerrilla warfare. This lasted until 1576, when Bayanog led an army to subdue them. He captured their rulers, paraded them around the vassal gates of Pegu in a triumph, then sold them as slaves in India. With his empire in a state of peace and all his rivals eliminated, Bayanog brought his attention onto religious matters. The brand of Buddhism he and many other Burmese and Thai followed was called Theravada Buddhism. It was brought to Burma from Ceylon, the island home to the modern day country of Sri Lanka, over 500 years ago. Theravada presented itself as the most original form of Buddhism. It was mostly secluded to Ceylon before the Burmese adoption, as the Hindu gods reigned supreme over the Indian subcontinent. In 1576, these Theravada brothers across the Indian Ocean called for aid from Bayanog. The Portuguese had designs on Ceylon for the past few decades, even stealing a tooth of the Buddha, a religious relic whose numbers should have been limited at 32, but always seemed to increase over the years. The King of Kote, whose lands rested on the western coast of Ceylon, presented Bayanog with his daughter's hand in marriage in 1573, and further sweetened this relationship by sending the emperor a tooth of the Buddha in 1576, likely to safeguard it from any of the numerous Portuguese raiding parties, or the rebellion that had just broken out in the kingdom of Cote. The tooth and a daughter were enough to secure military aid from the great Theravada king of Burma. Five warboats and 2,500 of Tungu's most elite soldiers made the journey across the Indian Ocean before arriving in western Ceylon. The gleeful king of Cote pointed in the direction of his rebellion, and the detachment of Tungu eliminated them with minimal losses. When the other kings of Ceylon learned of the Burmese arrival, three of them flocked to acquire an alliance with Tungu. This was in turn granted by the Tungu generals under the condition that the kings of Ceylon keep the Theravada faith alive. After this, the Tungu army returned to Bayanog, and the emperor sent sporadic detachments of men to assist the men of Ceylon, mostly against the encroaching Portuguese. After the return of the 1576 Ceylon expedition, Bayanog decided to give his empire a break from the systemic warfare that had formed it. From 1577 to 1580, this peace lasted, before it was disrupted by a rebellion in the far east of Langzhang. Bayanog gathered a large army and marched into the periphery of his empire. The rebels dispersed without a fight. All they needed was a little reminding of Tungu might. By this time in 1580, it had been 30 years since the death of Tavanshwadi, and Bayanog was nearing his 65th birthday. 
The days of leading armies from the front lines was long behind him, and the king's health started to slip. The crown prince, Nanda, took over many of Bayanog's responsibilities as he no longer had the energy to run the empire he had created. Bayanog knew his time was limited, and while he had restored Tavanshwedi's empire, he still hadn't avenged him completely. The kingdom of Arakan on the western coast had pushed back a Tungu invasion in 1547. It was only fitting that Bayanog would make his final campaign, the conquest of Arakan. 24,000 Tungu soldiers crossed the border, and just as they had in Tavanshwedi's campaign, they occupied Arakan, taking the stronghold city of Thandwe. All that was left was a march on the capital of Merakyu. Bayanog sent another army, numbering some 30,000 men, to reinforce the invasion. They, however, stayed inactive in Thandwe for most of a year. Bayanog wanted to lead the march on Merakyu himself, but the 65-year-old emperor grew gravely ill in 1581. He remained in this sickly state in Pegu, probably reflecting on his life full of war, conquest, and regrets, until his death came on October 10th of 1581. Bayanog's legacy remains active in the Burmese popular imagination. He is considered to be one of the three great kings of Burma, alongside Anawarta of Pagan and Alangwampaya of Kongbong. Bayanog is indeed probably the greatest among these three select kings, if the ranking is on military prowess alone. Bayanog is with no doubt the greatest conqueror in the history of Southeast Asia, and certainly one of the greatest conquerors of all time. But we must remember how he got here in the first place. If it was not for the trust and friendship that he shared with his crib mate, Taban Shwedi, then he would have never become king in the first place. There is no Taban Shwedi without Bayanog, and there is no Bayanog without Taban Shwedi, and without either one of them, there is no Tungu Empire. The conqueror of the Ten Directions, the universal ruler, and the most successful subjugator in the history of Southeast Asia. This is the immense legacy left behind by Emperor Bayanag of Tungu. A legacy that would be passed on to his son, Nanda Bayan. A legacy that would be impossible to surpass and challenging to even match. An awe-inspiring inheritance that would quickly prove to be its own downfall. Nanda Bayan was born in 1535, the first son of a nobleman named Bayanog and the sister of King Tabanshwedi of Tungu, Thakan Giyu. Nanda only had one other full-blooded sibling, an older sister named Mabia. Throughout his lifetime, Nanda would be sibling to 85 others, as his father would go on to marry a total of 95 women. Nanda would grow up in the Tungu capital of Pegu, alongside the children of Tabanshwedi. In 1542, at the age of seven, Nanda Bayan becomes the third in line for the throne of Tungu, as Taban Shwedi had declared his childhood friend, Bayanog, as his royal brother and named him as his heir apparent. Nando would be well-educated, with a strong emphasis on military training as he grew older. By the time he was 13, Prince Nanda joined his father and Taban Shwedi on their 1547 campaign of Thailand. This invasion would see Taban Shwedi's armies majorly defeated for the first time in his 15-year military career. The largest battle during this war would break out just in front of the walls of the Thai capital of Ayutthaya. During this battle, Nanda Bayan showed bravery and was granted military honors, although it is unclear how much this 13-year-old actually contributed to the state of the battle. This campaign would come to an end after a failed siege of Ayutthaya and a retreat back to Tungu. Three years after the Siam campaign, Emperor Taban Shwedi would be assassinated and Bayanog was supposed to become the ruler of Tungu. Instead, Taban Shwedi's empire devolved into rebellion in every corner. Nanda Bayan, his sister, and his mother were all forced to flee the city of Tungu where they resided, as the half-brother of Bayanog declared himself the new king of Tungu. After being on the run for nearly a year, the family is reunited with Bayanog as he moves to reconquer Tungu province. 
In early 1551, Bayanog takes Tungu City and shortly thereafter, formally crowns himself as king, alongside his son's coronation as crown prince. From this point onward, Nando would become an increasingly active general in Bayanog's military, accompanying his father and uncles, who held central command of the campaigns. Bayanog would always take into consideration Nanda's military advice, although Bayanog knew better in most scenarios. In 1564, Nanda would be the leader of his first campaign. His assignment was to conquer the land of Lang Zhang and capture its king, Setathirith. The crown prince managed to take the Lang Zhang capital of Vientian, but Setathirith had escaped into the jungles. Nanda Bayan installed a puppet king in Vientian and started after his chase for the king. This would prove a mistake, as the elusive king of Lang Zhang picked off Nandabayan's army and led him deep into the countryside before the prince decided to retreat. Hereafter, Bayanog never let Nanda lead a campaign, although he did remain commanding contingents on the ground for the next 15 years, as his father and uncles oversaw the campaigns that would form the largest empire in Southeast Asia. In 1579, Nanda took on a greater role in governing the empire, as Bayanog, had become ill. In 1580, Bayanog would order his last campaign, the conquest of the small but mighty Kingdom of Arakan. The Tungu managed to take the southern half of Arakan before Bayanog died in 1581. This would leave Nanda Bayan as the inheritor of the largest and most overextended empire in the history of Southeast Asia. Nanda, expecting his inheritance to follow a similar path that his father's had, immediately withdraws from the Arakan campaign and signs a peace treaty with the unconquerable inhabitants of the Rakhine coast. He would need all the soldiers he could muster to hold the Tungu Empire together. As 1581 turned into 1582, Nanda waited for the vassal kings loyal to his father to send their yearly tribute. One by one, each and every one of them arrives in Pegu, entering through their respective gate. All but one, that is. As expected, a rebellion breaks out against Nanda upon his coronation, although on a much smaller scale than anticipated. The tiny Shan state of Sanda, far to the north, takes this opportunity to attempt a break away from Tungu. Nanda immediately orders for a local army to crush this. By late 1582, the fortress of Sanda is taken, and the rebellion is ended. Nanda had passed his initial challenge of securing the empire. However, this was nowhere near the end of instability in Tungu. The governor of Ava and the half-brother of Bayanog, Thado Minsa, was not invited to the 1582 Sanda campaign. He was left slighted by this as he was the closest relative and most experienced general to the rebellion. By 1583, he sent out letters to the nearby governors of Tungu, Prom, and Lan Na two of which were the other surviving brothers of the late Bayanog. He instructed them that he was preparing to rebel against their nephew and rule northern Burma as a separate entity. All three of these letters were received and quickly forwarded to Emperor Nanda. A familial civil war was on the horizon. Not only was Thado Minsa the uncle of Nanda, but he was also married to Nanda's only full-blooded sibling, his older sister, Mabia. This would give Thado Minsa a degree of legitimacy to his rebellion, as he could now cite that he was simply taking his and his wife's half of Bayanog's inheritance. Once Nanda received notice of Thado Minsa's intentions, he called upon his vassals from central Burma and the eastern territories of Langjiang and Siam to assemble in the capital. All but one of these armies would arrive. Nanda marches on Ava and arrives under the walls in April 1584. Thado Minsa could nowhere near match the military might of almost the entirety of the Tungu Empire. Instead of fighting Nanda in a pitched battle that he would most assuredly lose, he challenged his nephew to single combat atop their war elephants. Nanda had spent a considerable amount of time commanding contingents of armies under Thado Minsa and had probably learned some important tricks of the trade from him, making this duel ever more dramatic, as teacher met disciple. The two elephants and their riders charged at one another, neither finding their swings hit home on the other. This endured for some time as the two combatants matched each other on every ride by. At some point, perhaps after an injury to himself or his elephant, Thado Minsa fled from the duel 
and escaped into the countryside with his small army. He died shortly after this, suggesting that he was probably wounded in the engagement. Hereafter, Nan Nabayan appointed his cousin, and the son of Emperor Tabanshwedi, the loyal Min Letya, as the governor of Ava. With the defeat of Thado Minsaw, peace was restored to the Tungu Empire. But there is still one very pressing issue. One of the vassal armies that Nanda ordered on this campaign never showed up. The largest and most rebellious subject, Siam. With the memory of a hard-fought rebellion in 1569 still fresh in the minds of the Thai, the king of Siam, Maha Thamaracha, declared independence from Tungu in May of 1584. By this, it appears that the king of Siam was waiting for cracks to show in Nanda's empire, and the rebellion of Thado Minsaw was the perfect chance to pounce. While the army of Siam ordered to Pegu by Emperor Nanda never showed up at the capital, it did mobilize under their crown prince, a young man named Naraswan. Naraswan had grown up in Pegu for a large portion of his childhood, alongside Nanda Bayan's children and the other hostage children of Tungu's many vassal kings. From a young age, he had shown a depth skill in military strategy, and now, a general trained in the art of Burmese warfare, sat just across the river from Pegu with a 6,000-man army. Before Emperor Ananda could return from his elephant duel at Ava, he ordered for a 5,000-man army to chase Naraswan back to Thailand. The small force found the army of Naraswan. The only thing separating the two was the flowing waters of the Sitang River. Seeing the opposing army, Prince Naraswan sought to find a victory without fighting a battle, and with only firing one shot. Naraswan, holding a musket with an incredibly long barrel, took his aim and fired across the Sitang River. A moment later, the leader of the Tungu army fell dead from his elephant. After this, Naraswan returned to Thailand without a fight and prepared to meet a Tungu invasion leaving the leaderless 5,000 men across the Sitang River at a standstill. Emperor Nanda returned to Pegu shortly after Naraswan evacuated. Along with his son and the crown prince, Swa, he gathers a force of 6,000 to join the other 5,000. This army, led by Nanda, intended to reconquer their pesky Siamese vassal. There were only three problems with that. One, and perhaps most pressing, was that 11,000 men was simply not enough to take Thailand. Two, the campaign was hastily planned by Nanda, whose only strategy was to march on the capital city of Ayutthaya. Lastly, the campaign would start in the middle of the rainy season. Nanda would enter Thailand and march towards the Chao Phraya River, where he would then march down the banks until reaching Ayutthaya. Do you see where this is going? Nanda's small army got caught in the marshes of a flooded river in the rainy season, while small Thai war canoes maneuvered around his army and severely defeated them. Nanda was forced to retreat from Thailand, as the independence of Siam was secured during their initial rebellion. Nanda and the remnants of his defeated army returned to Pegu. The loss of Siam, while it was surely a big hit, did not threaten to tear the empire apart directly. What threatened to tear the empire apart was the other vassals of Tungu, who could now look at this rebellion and see that the empire of Nanda was weak and could be defeated. This brought up the question of, is it possible, and at that point, even worth it to reconquer Siam? If it was anything like Bayanog and Tabanshwedi's campaigns that Nanda was both present at, then the answer would be no. No, the rebellious subject was not worth the trouble. But Nanda's hand would be forced into acting, lest he lose the loyalty of his remaining vassals. To win the favor of his people and the gods, Nanda donated five large and well-sculpted statues of Buddha to various monasteries in Pegu. Maybe this would allow him to reconquer Siam. In 1586, the Tungu armies reassembled to the number of 12,000, which was still not enough to subdue their southern rival. This time, they would be led by the eldest of Nanda's 19 children, Crown Prince Swa. His strategy had evolved to more than just a bum rush to Ayutthaya. The plan was to invade from northern Thailand and cut the country in two from east to west until he reached the capital. There was only one thing in the way of Crown Prince Swa, and that was his contemporary Crown Prince of Siam, Naraswan. 
Nariswan had anticipated the Tungu strategy and held himself in a fort guarding the northern border of Siam. A siege ensued in which Nariswan managed to hold back Prince Swa until the salvation of the rainy season and a Tungu withdrawal. The campaign would resume in 1587. This time Nanda sent his son with a force of 27,000, a sizable army that had more of a chance at conquering Siam, but only about half the number Bayanog had used on two separate occasions, and he barely won those wars. Regardless, the invasion began on the same course as the previous one, starting from the north. Crown Prince Swa overcame the fortress that had halted him in the previous year. From here, he marched his way down the river that eventually connected to Ayutthaya. He arrived before the walls with his army mostly intact. While he reached the capital, Ayutthaya was a whole nother beast in itself. Boasting some of the best defenses in Southeast Asia, this island fortress would be a challenge for anyone to take. The large army was simply not prepared for the long siege that they were forced into. After a few months in front of the walls of Ayutthaya, Prince Swa withdrew and started the long march back to friendly territories. The withdrawal quickly turned into retreat, as Prince Nariswan chased the Tungu army the whole way, harassing them at any chance he got in a great display of guerrilla warfare. By the time the Tungu army returned to Pegu, there was nearly nothing left of their 27,000-man army. The campaign was put to a stop by Nanda as he debated the Siamese question again. As predicted, it was appearing ever more so that Thailand was not worth the trouble of tens of thousands of dead Tungu soldiers. The other subjects of Tungu began to take notice of the increasing weakness of Nanda's realm. The Shan state of Inya, in the heart of the empire, revolted. It would take the Tungu armies a total of seven months to subdue them, an easy campaign that would have taken the armies of Bayanog mere weeks to put down. Witnessing this rebellion in the center of his empire put Nanda Bayan on edge. In the following year, 1588, he started to appoint more relatives as governors and vassal kings of the empire. This would have the positive effect of making the Tungu Empire more stable during good times, but it would also have the adverse effect of making the empire more susceptible to mass rebellion in the event that Nanda's empire begins to collapse. In 1590, an opportunity to retake Thailand emerged when King Thamaracha died and left his son, Nariswan, to become the new monarch. Nanda thought that this would weaken Siam, but he couldn't have been more wrong. The emperor assembled his largest army to date, some 30,000 men to restore his empire. Now this was an army that could conquer Siam, but it would never arrive fully intact. In 1590, the troublesome Shan state farthest to the north, Mogong, revolted against the empire. This would force Emperor Nanda to split his 30,000-man army intended for Thailand. 10,000, under the leadership of Nanda's nephew, Natsheng Nong, would march north to subdue Mogong, while 20,000 under Crown Prince Swa would continue the Siam campaign as intended. Being stretched from their most northern region to their most southern, the Tungu Empire looked as if it might snap. Prince Swa took his normal route of invading Thailand from the north, but the now King Nariswan was prepared to meet him. Held up in the same fortress where he had initially defeated Prince Swa, he again holds the Tungu at bay before they're forced to retreat. Upon the army's return to Pegu, a frustrated Nanda berates his son, and if he wasn't losing enough already, he orders to execute the other top generals in the campaign. While the fourth invasion of Siam was as much of a disaster as the other ones, the Mogong campaign did manage to find success, putting two separate revolts down until the Northern Shan were finally subdued in 1592. In that same year, King Nariswan started to go on the offensive, raiding vast portions of the Tenasserim coast before returning to the safety of Siam. This would prompt a fifth invasion of Siam as 24,000 men under Prince Swa set forth towards Thailand. King Nariswan sent out a small detachment of men to lure the Burmese prince into an ambush. Despite having the element of surprise, the Thai forces were outnumbered by their foe, who quickly turned the tides of the battle in their favor. All appeared lost, as Nariswan looked as if he may suffer his first defeat. Nariswan, who was himself in the midst of combat, had one more trick up his sleeve. Surrounded by the chaos of war, he roared across the battlefield, 
challenging Prince Swa to an elephant duel. The crown prince, had he declined, most likely would have won the battle. Instead, his arrogance saw him accept the challenge. As boys, these two men probably sparred together in Pegu. This would be one final rematch. Winner takes all. Prince Swa swung first, missing Narasuan in a diagonal attack. Narasuan, in response, stands in his saddle and swings down on the prince. He splits his skull and kills the future ruler of Tungu. This duel would lead to the defeat of the Tungu army, who retreated without their prince back to Pegu. This death, more than anything, symbolized the future of the Tungu Empire. It was doomed to fall, just as its future ruler had fallen from his elephant. Concluding this crushing victory, Narasuan goes on the offensive again and captures much of the southern part of the Tennessee coast as he begins to chip away at the Tungu Empire. With the death of his eldest son, the next in line to become Crown Prince of Tungu was his brother, Kwayawaswa. Not only this loss, but Emperor Nanda also had to deal with a rebellion just outside of Pegu. It was easily stomped out, but this was a terrible sign of things to come. If the subjects of Tungu this close to the capital were brave enough to rebel, then that meant that everybody else in the empire was as well. King Narasuan resumed his campaign taking the rest of the Tanasirum coast with little fight until reaching the city of Martaban. Here, the garrison of this highly defensible city give up without a fight. The Thai king was beginning to be viewed as a liberator by the ethnically Mon people of the southern Tungu Empire. They join his army as he quickly marches on Pegu itself. When King Narasuan arrived under the 20 gates of Pegu, Nanda was completely caught off guard. He hadn't expected Narasuan to march this deep into his empire, and he hadn't even assembled an army to match the king of Siam. Before the siege could begin, Nanda sent out for aid from his vassals to the north, while the new crown prince, Kwayawaswa, began to conscript everyone he could into the Tungu army, including the elderly and even Buddhist monks, who had devoted their lives to peace. Narasuan puts Pegu to the siege for the better part of a year, attempting to take the city where he had spent a large portion of his childhood. Eventually, a number of the vassals that Nanda had called upon arrive at Pegu to relieve the siege. Upon hearing of the arrival of these armies, Narasuan decides to return to Siam in 1595. All but one of the vassal kings called upon came to the aid of Emperor Nanda, that being the governor of Prom, Nanda's own son, Dado Damayaza. If his father couldn't even protect his own capital, then how was he supposed to defend Prome? The armies of Prome managed to take the ever-important city of Pagan, and even besiege the city of Tungu, where they're finally repelled. In under a year, the three most important cities at the center of the Tungu Empire had been besieged. While only one of these cities was taken, this showed the increasing weakness of the realm. If Nanda couldn't defend these three key cities, then how is he supposed to defend the vastness of the empire that his father had created? Seeing the imminent collapse of the Tungu Empire made their most eastern vassal, Lang Zhang, declare independence in a mostly bloodless matter. The Tungu decided not to respond, and this was a good decision, if Sadathira's son was anything like his father. The revolt of Nanda's son in Prome continued being the pressing issue. Eventually, in 1597, Nanda's brother, the governor of Ava, Neon Gion, retook the city of Pagan from Prome and pushed that Odamayaza back to his original domains as governor. The map now looked eerily identical to how it did when Tungu first emerged onto the political scene in 1510. The governor of Tungu province and Nanda's cousin, Thayathu, alongside Nanda's own brother, Narada Minsa of Lan Na, started a joint rebellion. Everyone with any kind of connection with Nanda was now trying to gain a slice of the collapsing Tungu Empire. The Shan, as well as Manipur, used this opportunity to break away from Pegu as well. This new set of rebellions would cut the still loyal portions of Nanda's empire in half, thereby forcing his brother, Neon Gion of Ava, to start acting mostly on his own accord although he never formally declared himself independent from Nanda. 
his realm would prove to be the most stable in the Fallen Empire. Exactly at the Tungu Empire's weakest point is exactly when the nation of Arakan was finally awakened. Seeking revenge from previous campaigns, the king of Arakan, Razagiyu, allied himself to the rebel king of Tungu province, Thayathu. With Arakan's powerful navy and the manpower of Tungu province, the two armies invaded what was left of Nanda's once massive empire in 1598. For that year, the rebellious cousin of Nanda took a town located directly outside of Pegu. With this as their base of operations, they waited until the next year to march on the capital. In March of 1599, Arakanese marines land just south of Pegu and claim the land as their own until they arrived at the walls of Pegu, meeting their ally there by April. The combined force lays siege to the capital, but the walls, no matter how bad their leader, always seem to stand strong. This would be no short siege, if Nanda really wished to keep his city. While Nanda was determined to continue the fight, his son and the crown prince, Kwayawaswa, saw the plain despair of the situation and surrendered to his cousin shortly after the siege had begun. He was promised fair treatment and was sent to the city of Tungu. The siege continued until December of 1599, and just before the turn of the new century, Nanda Bayan surrendered to his rebellious cousin. Following this, Pegu was burned, and its vast treasury, acquired from the farthest reaches of mainland Southeast Asia, were split amongst the allied Arakanese and rebel Tungu forces. The rebel Tungu then took the rest of Nanda's empire, as Arakan held onto the land that they had conquered. The Tungu Empire was no more, and it had fallen at the hands of Nanda Bayan. But was it really his fault? He inherited an impossible position, and it was unlikely that he could have held the whole empire together, although he did try. I can identify two main mistakes that Nanda Bayan made that led to the total collapse of Tungu. First and foremost, he should have just left Siam after the first or second time he tried to reconquer it. He wasted over a hundred thousand men during the course of five separate invasions, for nothing. Containing an independent Siam would have been a much easier task, and he probably could have kept the rest of his empire held together. The second mistake that Nanda made was not commanding his own armies after his second campaign as emperor. Nanda was by no means a military strategist like Bayanog, but he had proven that he was a more than capable field commander. Had the Emperor of Tungu been present at some of the battles and campaigns, then maybe they would have found more victories. Regardless, the Emperor's surrender was accepted by his cousin. He was forced to capitulate his royal title, but would be allowed to live as an honored guest in the city of Tungu. Arriving at the city, he likely expected to see his son, Kwayawaswa. However, he had been assassinated despite being promised a good treatment. Natsing Nong, the nephew of Nanda and governor of Tungu City under the new regime, had killed him for unknown reasons. This probably made Nanda Bayan paranoid, as unlike his son, Natsing Nong had a reason to despise Nanda. Nanda had rejected the marriage of Natsing Nong to his true love. Yaza Datu Kalaya. The reason was because she was the widow of Nanda's first son, the dead Prince Swa. The nervous Nanda's life came into immediate danger shortly after he arrived in Tungu City. In the year 1600, the vengeful king of Thailand, Naraswan, came knocking at the city of Tungu. He wanted one thing and one thing only, the retired emperor. This was rejected, and the city came under siege. However, it didn't last for long before Naraswan left to deal with more local matters in Thailand. Nanda would celebrate his 65th birthday as a captive in Tungu City. At the end of that same month of November, he was betrayed and executed like his son, on the orders of Natsing Nong. In the short time that it existed, the Tungu Empire rose from a small backwater city-state to become the largest empire in the history of Southeast Asia. 
Its dramatic rise was almost as fast as its inevitable fall. So, how did this even happen? How did this empire rise from nothing to the most powerful empire in Asia, with the exception of Ming China? The answer lies with its rulers. All four kings and subsequent emperors of Tonggu were extremely competent men. Even Nandabayan, although he may be on the lower end of that spectrum. The growth and collapse of the Tonggu Empire is nothing more than the Leviathan itself, working in hyperspeed. The Leviathan is a theory that a society will eat itself alive by becoming what it despises the most. Tonggu rose under the peace-loving King Niao as a hotspot for refugees attempting to escape a war-torn Burma. The Tonggu Empire was built by the endless wars of Tavan Shwedi and the ever-expanding Bayanog. This empire collapsed under Nandabayan and became the war-torn land that refugees were initially trying to escape. 